Hello, Pittsburgh and P4. I, uh, yeah, I hope you guys are as excited to be here as I am. Um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I, I've spent the last 20 years looking at megatrends around urbanization, climate change, bit of a city wonk. And I have to confess, this is actually the first time that I've been to Pittsburgh, and it's been, uh, so I can cross that off my bucket list now. And a huge thank you to the city of Pittsburgh and the Heinz Foundation for bringing us all together. But before we get going, um, I have, to, I have to share something with you. If you, everybody hasn't walked out onto a stage like this to a theme song, <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, but it was interesting, the selection of this song, the title of this, if you don't know, is Truth to Power, Speaking Truth to Power. And it's actually really apropos for what I want to talk to you about today, but not in the broader context about cities emerging onto the scene over the last decade as global change makers, but in fact something um, that happened right here a little less than a year ago. Uh, and I have a, you know, another confession to make. I have a little bit of a professional crush on Mayor Peduto. I don't know if he's in the room or not. But last year, there was this little uh, incident happened where um, our, our current president thought it'd be a good idea to announce that we're withdrawing from the historic Paris Agreement. He held a big event about this and everybody in the, in the space had, had been expecting this. Uh, and it was launched with a lot of fanfare, and my, me and lots of people in the community had been spending that day on the kind of news circuits, radio news. But I looked up that evening, and I saw Mayor Peduto uh, on live TV, international TV, with Wolf Blitzer. And when Trump pulled out, one of the quotes he had is, I was, you know, elected to represent the pit people of Pittsburgh, not Paris. And it was unbelievably, like, impassioning and emboldening for somebody like me to see the mayor of Pittsburgh stand up on national TV and say, you don't represent the people of Pittsburgh, I do, and Pittsburgh is still in the Paris Agreement. That's right. And that is a perfect example of some of the global reaction we saw to this, kind of this movement kind of ricocheted around the world and you saw this upwelling of support and political leadership and it was from mayors, it was from cities around the world. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about C40, C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. It's been around for about 12 years. And what we do is we work with mega city mayors and we, we network and share information and ideas between these mayors. Our current chair of C40 is the mayor of Paris, Mayor Anne Hidalgo. Um, and one of the things that allows us to, to do so much and implement so much is, you can see this quote up from her, but oftentimes the best advice to get from somebody is somebody who's at your job or walked a mile in your shoes. And that's basically what we do with mayors. We allow them to talk about the issues that they're being challenged with. We allow them to talk about their failures as much as their successes. And through that model, we can leapfrog policy interaction and implementation in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to a changing climate. The other thing I think a lot of people don't often remember, and one of the, actually our earlier speakers talked about an amazing lineup of speakers. They mentioned something about the competitive nature of cities. And a lot of people don't realize that cities is a competitive business. You need to attract talent, you need to attract businesses, you need to attract people. And at a point in our, the history of the, our planet that where it's the, it's the cheapest and we have the most freedom to move around and decide what city to live in, that's a big competition, they're big stakes. However, what's happening at the city level, which is not happening in many other kind of institutions, government levels, etc., is a willingness to collaborate. And they're doing it out of necessity. They're not doing it because mayors are great visionaries. In fact, my belief is that mayors are great pragmatists. They gotta make sure the schools are open, they gotta take out the garbage, they gotta keep the lights on the street. And when things disrupt those daily activities of providing for their citizens, they have to take action. And if they're not getting the support or the leadership to do that, they're going to do it themselves. And as a result, we're creating a race to the top. Another great analogy that I love to give on this, uh, Mayor Reed from Atlanta uses this all the time. Just imagine the CEO of Coke and the CEO of Pepsi bumping into each other at the airport lounge. And the CEO of, of Coke says, man, you remember that tasty beverage you did, Crystal Pepsi? Man, I love that. What happened to that? I'd love to do that if you're not going to use it. Give me the recipe. Right, chuckling, right? Yeah, see you later, gets off. But what happens when Mayor Peduto goes over the border and visits his friend and colleague, the mayor of uh, Edmonton, Don Iveson, and he sees a really cool transportation project that's rolling out. He's like, man, we're grappling with the same thing. Would you mind if I sent a couple of my top people to the transportation department to, to meet with you, figure out how you rolled out this project? No problem. Tell me when and where we'll roll out the red carpet. And that is happening around the world. 
So as I mentioned before, we're a collection of 96 mega cities all over the world, totally international. We have cities on every inhabited continent. And let me share a little facts about why cities are so important. So first off, cities represent 85% of the world's gross domestic product. And C40 cities, just the 96 that we work with, generate a quarter of the world's gross domestic product. Thereby, when we get these cities to commit to something and to take action, we tip the needle on a global scale and we provide a pathway forward for others to follow. But at the same time, if we're trying to tackle climate change on a global scale and we leave cities out of that debate and out of that equation, we will not be successful. As of 2008, for the first time in the history of the, of the planet, more than 50% of people lived in cities. And that's not slowing down. About a million and a half people are moving every week from rural areas into urban areas around the world. It's projected that by 2050, 75% of the world's population will be living in cities. And what that means looks very different depending on where you are in the world. Sub-Saharan Africa, for an example, that, that urbanization is taking place in informal settlements without access to water, electricity, heating and cooling. So we have to rethink what cities look like and we have to do it at an unprecedented rate. And at the same time, cities represent about 70% of the energy consumption that happens in the world. So they're a huge driver of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So again, we have to tackle this. But they're also the nexus of where the confluence of climate change and urbanization happening. Because there's a densification of infrastructure and investment and people, when there are impacts based on you know, extreme droughts or extreme weather events, that is where the impacts are concentrated. So they're on the front lines of dealing with this. That's why cities are so critical in addressing this in the global nature. So we've been working on raising the awareness of non-state actors, any non-governmental entities, in, in how important cities are to collaborate with, to drive, and to implement. But something really historic happened. After 28 years of negotiation, 195 countries that are party to the UN finally agreed, thank God, on a climate treaty. And it was a, it was a historic moment. But how that was achieved, it was achieved through a process of consensus and ratcheting up. So let's start here and move it forward. And as a result at C40, we wanted to think deeply about what cities' roles were in implementing the commitments that national governments have made. And we wanted to figure out how we can take an ambitious and aspirational goal set by the Paris Climate Agreement and implement that at a local level. So we started crunching the numbers. And there's something else important I want to tell you about that is that in the, when that treaty got created, it was to hold the world below two degrees Celsius of warming from a pre-industrial level. But there was a group of countries called the High Ambition Coalition, which became known as HAC. And they were largely led by low-lying island nations. And this is important because as this deal is getting formulated, they emerged as a really strong driver of more ambition than that. Because two degrees of warming isn't enough for island nations. Sea level rise will consume their countries. They're, those countries don't exist at two degrees. So they said it's not good enough. So we put in this with an ambition to do more in 1.5. So we at C40 wanted to understand what a 1.5 scenario would look like in terms of an implementation pathway for cities. And when we crunched the numbers, we found some really interesting stuff. We found that if every city over 100,000 people in the, in the world adopted a 1.5 climate agreement uh, within their city and began implementing that, you could reduce 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions required under the Paris Agreement. That's a big number. But we wanted to dig a little bit further. So what we ended up doing is we ended up calculating what the remaining global carbon budget is to hold within 1.5 degrees. And then what we did is we allocated that on a per capita basis to C40 cities. It's roughly 700 million people that reside in our 96 member cities. So their carbon budget, what they have left to emit under that kind of threshold is 22 gigatons. Okay, what does that mean? And we wanted to put this in perspective. And what we found is that if C40 cities were to continue as a, on a business as usual, meaning their population continues to grow, they continue making business as usual decisions on infrastructure, et cetera, in a high carbon pathway, C40 cities, the 96 of them, would consume their remaining carbon budget in a 1.5 degree threshold by 2025. Let, think about that for a minute. More staggeringly, if 96 of the world's largest cities continued on that business as usual trajectory, by 2060, they would consume the remaining carbon budget for the world by 2060 in a 1.5 degree scenario. This really made us rethink what we were doing and needing to drive a whole new level of urgency on this issue. So what we did is we ended up coming up with a program called Deadline 2020. 
And what Deadline 2020 did is start backing up from a carbon neutral scenario in 2050 to what has to happen now. And we have to take four times as many actions as is currently being implemented in C40 cities by 2020 at a cost of, we're estimating roughly $365, $375 billion in the next four years. One of the most exciting days of my professional career is we have this gathering every two years. We bring all the mayors together for this meeting. We have a mayoral summit, and we did this in Mexico City. And I had driven a big part of this research that we need to do, and we wanted to roll it out to all of our member cities and talk to them about the urgency and the imperative of taking action at a whole new level. Very nervous about how cities would receive this. Too pie in the sky, too impossible, too transformative. And what happened, we have a steering committee of cities that actually govern us. We were, we were run under the direction of mayors from around the world. We sat down in a meeting with them, and those mayors did not flinch on this message. And they, there was a unanimous agreement to make a conditional membership of C40 requiring that every city adopt a 1.5 climate action plan. It was incredible. So now C40 is rolling this out across all our 96 cities and helping cities develop 1.5 climate action plans that are inclusive of both mitigation and adaptation. But a lot of people say, well, this is, this is a little crazy. It's going to take a lot of money, which is all true. We really have to transform our communities, can transform our economies, transform the way we're taking decisions and how we make decisions. But it's also important, while that is daunting, to realize what happens, what's at stake if we do not do this? Just on a financial perspective, we crunch the numbers again. And what we found is if we put off the tough decisions now that we need to make in terms of density, urban, urbanization, transportation, access, affordable housing, it's gonna be four times more expensive to do it in the future because we're gonna have stranded assets. We're gonna have to tear out infrastructure that we're building now that's not fit for purpose. Another, this is a slide Al Gore uses a lot, which I love too, because what we're talking about is some radical action. And people say, what if we get this wrong? Oh, what if it's a big hoax and we just created a better world for nothing? Oh no. And there's lots of stuff we're gonna get wrong on the way, don't get me wrong, but there's much more impacts if we don't, if we don't act now. And there's much bigger issues aside from just the impacts associated with taking action on climate change. So for an example, if we do nothing, it's estimated that we're going to have 2 million, 200 million climate refugees by 2050. Think about that. Just think about what's happening right now in the Middle East, in Europe, in North Africa associated with, climate refugee, uh, with refugees right now. And some portion of that being attributed to climate. It's massive. Same thing happens if we look at what's going to happen from climate change impacts associated with poverty. By 2030, there's an estimated 100 million people that will be pushed or forced into extreme poverty by 2030. These are massive global challenges. The exciting thing is that cities are doing something about this. They're racing ahead when other forms of diplomacy and international governments are not. They're taking action. They're binding together to do it. So while I want to impress upon you the urgency of the situation. It's also exciting. I spend my time traveling the world, talk, around the world talking to mayors, sharing ideas, and I can tell you, I can share with you the hope and opportunity that I see and the radical action that is being taken and events like this, P4, where you're bringing local stakeholders together and you're really deeply thinking about what you need to do and how you need to do it. And in particularly, in, in order to transform what you're doing and be inclusive about it. And by doing this and by tackling climate change, it is not just an issue of climate change, it is an issue of creating successful cities. And when we do that, we're creating healthier cities. We're creating cities that have cleaner air, that have cleaner water, that have more green spaces. We're creating cities that are wealthier. We're creating jobs. We're shortening the distances with which it takes to travel into a city, which means there's more time for productivity. And we're creating more inclusive environments. We're in, this, this disruption, this transformation is an opportunity to rethink what we haven't gotten right in urbanization and development over the last hundred years and find a new model of development, a new model of community that is the right one. So with that, uh, I will leave you those thoughts of, of urgency, of need, but of opportunity and great action. Thank you very much.